So usually I like to say that it's a pleasure to come back again to AG City, which it is in a way, but it's also sad because I never imagined AG City without Jill Lesho. You know, usually he would be the first person I would see when I land in Marseille, and uh, uh, that's not going to be the same thing. So uh, I decided to use the slides, unlike Misha, because I want, I'll show you a few pictures. One is already here, which is from his web page. Uh, maybe some more pictures. It's like when he was somewhat younger. Uh, this is also, you can find. This is a, this is, uh, maybe it's not so clear, but it's a picture taken in his office, which is uh, not far from here. And uh, well, this picture is in this room where you can see Jill here listening intently to you know who. <clears throat> and uh, so these are the sources. Uh, I think David is looking somewhere else though. Um, but uh, so as, uh, so I just uh, want to quickly summarize uh, his, uh, his career in brief because uh, so as, as, as Misha mentioned that uh, he obtained his uh, doctorate, uh, which is, I think, a little higher than PhD, uh, Dr. Adeta, from uh, Paris uh, 7 in the year 1979 with uh, Godma, and that was the title of his thesis, uh, Spectral Analysis and Analytic Continuation, Eisenstein Series, Zeta Functions, and Solutions of Diophantine Equations. So you see many of the themes recurring in his later years are already there. I was just looking up, and interestingly, it was in the year 1979 that uh, three students got their degree from Godma. And one of them, I think, is here. Uh, so Jill was one of them, and uh, it seems Francois Rodier and uh, Christophe uh, Soule. And I think these were the last batch of students of Roger Godma. So <clears throat> Godma himself is extremely interesting, but I'm not uh, uh, going to talk about him today. Anyway, I don't know him as well, obviously. Uh, so, just to continue with this, uh, uh, again very briefly, so I suppose this is probably a prize he got for his thesis, uh, and uh, he has, for most of his uh, professional life, he held a position with CNRS, uh, maybe initially in Paris and then in Nice for a little while, and then for most part he has been at uh, Marseille, and he was the... He was the second director of this Institute uh, of Mathematics Meeting, CIRM, uh, and uh, he uh, was responsible for the years uh, uh, September 1986 to August 1991. You can find this on the web page of CIRM. And he was uh, also the person who is, uh, really uh, laid the foundations of the library that you see here. Uh, you know, this is... Uh, and he was the director of this uh, Institute of Mathematics of Lumini for, as you can see, a long time. And those of us you know, who have had some small amount of administrative experience can admire being in that position for something like 11 years. Uh, as uh, Eve writes in one of his articles, he, he led with tact and intelligence. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he is, as Misha also mentioned, is a, was a founder of this meeting which uh, go back about 32 years uh, and has had many students. Several of them are here. Um, many also sort of a postdoc habilitation, if you like. And I uh, had the pleasure of attending a conference for his 60th birthday uh, called Saga Symposium on Algebraic Geometry and Applications, which was uh, held uh, in Tahiti in 2007, whose proceedings uh, appeared a uh, year later by World Scientific. And, you know, I mean, these days uh, we have access to internet and so on and so forth, which once upon a time uh, was only imagined, I suppose. And it is possible to learn about uh, what somebody is doing in a few clicks. Uh, you can, say, go to MathSciNet and try to find out uh, what they have been up to. I sometimes call it looking up the horoscope. And, uh, of course, it tells you something, not everything. Anyway, I did that, so here is a... Here is the math sign it, if you like, uh, just some numbers. Uh, 
and uh, he, he can, is a very respectable number of papers with a large number of citations. I just want to sort of what is interesting here is the range of subjects uh, that appear here. You know, of course, algebraic geometry, number theory is prominent, information and communication, so coding would come here, but also uh, several complex variables, uh, partial differential equations, topological groups, Lie groups. Uh, manifolds and cell complexes and of course history. So it's not, these days it's not common to find this kind of a range in, in people and, uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so here are his collaborators, I guess I feature among them. Uh, anyway, so one, although we are into counting one thing or another, one doesn't always just count the number, but uh, one, so some major themes uh, of, uh, of his work, uh, I would say, uh, could be sort of divided. And I just put some uh, catch words and some representative uh, papers of his. So uh, his thesis uh, had to do with automorphic forms and uh, resulted in a rather substantial paper, uh, this uh, in a major symposium of the, you know, this proceedings of symposia in pure maths and a long paper in Invencione and another one in uh, Invencione. <clears throat> and uh, what is kind of interesting is, well, this is uh, uh, only roughly speaking in automorphic forms, but he sort of returns to it, and this is his last published paper here, which is, in fact, in the proceedings of the previous AGCT. And uh, <clears throat> then I will sort of divide his, uh, his other work. His, uh, he worked a lot on curves and abelian varieties over finite field, uh, starting with this note in the French Academy, uh, and uh, and of course uh, Jacobians and abelian varieties. Uh, this is this was subject of one of his talks here, where he showed us a lot of explicit calculation that some of us uh, may remember. Uh, and uh, I would also mention work with Christoph Riesenthaler. Uh, I don't know what he will speak about, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, so these are some of the papers which you could put broadly in the areas of curves and uh, abelian varieties uh, and uh, related objects. And uh, I sort of separate that from uh, algebraic varieties, uh, which uh, roughly corresponds to higher dimensional algebraic varieties, say surfaces upwards and uh, uh, not those that are not necessarily irreducible, if you like algebraic sets over finite field and starts with the with the paper uh, that Misha mentioned, this 60-page paper in Crelle, and uh, then maybe I put the paper uh, that we wrote together, um, and a, a much more recent work with uh, Robert Roland, who is also here, um, which had to do with number of points of algebraic sets over finite field. And I'll, I'll say something about the last two in, in a moment from now. Uh, he. He held, uh, I mean, for a long time he was, uh, I think this was a topic which was close to his heart, uh, continued fractions, sales, and Klein polyhedra. And although he wrote few papers on it, he, he often told me that he had plans to write a book. Uh, unfortunately, I think that has not seen the light of the day, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe there is a manuscript that some people know. Uh, or can revive, but uh, I remember Jill mentioning many times that he's working on a book on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, he uh, more or less uh, laid uh, the interest in, in, in French mathematics on, on coding theory, especially uh, aspects coming from uh, algebraic geometry after the invention of the so-called Gopa codes. So he, he wrote up the, he gave this seminar Bourbaki. Uh, as you can see, very shortly after Gopas' papers appeared, and this was among the first uh, publications, I think, in Europe uh, on, on that topic. I suppose another, his, another of his contribution to coding theory is to bring Misha Fassman and Serge Vladut here in France, and uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> which is, of course, not listed in the publications. Uh, but uh, 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 one of... Uh, his close collaborators and friends, and who unfortunately is also no more, I remember him uh, quite uh, fondly, Jack Wolfman. And with him, he wrote a uh, few papers. Uh, in fact, uh, I think this paper uh, is, is very, very highly cited. Maybe it has more than 90 citations and so on. So people, uh, I mean, you, you can sort of see the review and the coding theorists are thanking Jill for the signal service he's doing to the community by 
making the related mathematics much more accessible and so on and so forth. This is a relatively simple paper, but has had a considerable impact, uh, which is uh, really sort of translating things uh, into coding theory that uh, uh, he had just learned, I suppose. Uh, I, I will come back to this, this work. And here are some more papers, uh, uh, again, um, sort of uh, forming a bridge between uh, counting points of varieties over finite field and applications to linear codes, uh, uh, as well as uh, things uh, coming from number theory, uh, exponential sums, and uh, uh, you know Eisenstein series, and so on and so forth. So uh, OK, these are a couple of papers, uh, again, that I wrote with him. And this last paper is kind of interesting. It grew out of a workshop. Uh, that was held not too long ago in uh, in Los Angeles, where we were expected to assemble in a group of six, and uh, you know not uh, you know people don't lecture to each other, but sort of take up a problem, and just discuss, and that's the only thing you do for a week. And uh, we were very apprehensive of that experiment, but it actually turned out to be rather uh, rather productive and. Uh, uh, I suppose I wrote my paper with maximum number of co-authors, and probably so did Jill. So this is the sixth author paper uh, that we have in the, in fact, uh, a volume of Springer for women in mathematics. Uh, also happy to have something there. Uh, okay. So uh, so anyway, that's just a, just a summary. I want to uh, maybe uh, focus on maybe just give you some sampling of the work. And uh, I have chosen this, and uh, there is a reason why I have displayed the cover page of the paper I wrote uh, with Jill uh, several years ago. And that's because, you know, <clears throat> uh, obviously, you know, I come from India. And this is a paper uh, which, uh, which appeared in a special volume of Moscow Math Journal for Manin's 65th birthday. But uh, you see here a, a quote is written. And this is, uh, for those who may not be aware, this is written in the Devanagari script. And this is, a, this is actually a quote from Rig Veda. Uh, what it says is, it says, Tirashchino vitato rashmiresham. What that means, uh, it's, it's translated over here, probably you cannot read. Uh, and uh, it roughly translates to saying their cord was extended across. And this is, uh, and anybody who kind of sees this and sees some Indian name would think that I would be responsible for putting that. But that is not true. It was Jill who came up with that, uh, you know, and he sort of insisted that we have uh, we have this quote from uh, Rigveda, which is one of the uh, ancient uh, texts, uh, you would say, uh, and it it has sort of has multiple meaning. What what that uh, alludes to their chord was extended across is, you know, you sort of think of a scientific or if you like mathematical thought as some continuous ether which is being passed from one generation to another. And like we build on the work of predecessors and, you know, of course, uh, one is reminded of Newton and so on. And you kind of uh, extending the work of uh, older masters and, oh, sorry. But uh, there was a dual meaning to it. Uh, the cord was extended across. As I will uh, mention, this paper also uses a lot of Bertini theorem. So it involves taking you know, sections and so on and so forth. So there is also that, uh, that meaning. So I just wanted to show that and mention that uh, really, uh, I had nothing to do with that quote except to typeset it in uh, Devanagari script here. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> OK, so coming back to the, to the contents, maybe you know, I should show some theorem. So uh, before that, perhaps uh, I should give some background. So let us, uh, and everybody here, of course, knows about the way conjectures and so on. But uh, there was a time when they were conjectures and not theorems. And at that time, uh, one of the sort of basic estimate one had for uh, you know counting the number of points of just an arbitrary uh, projective variety, or uh, you have similar things for a fine variety uh, over a finite field is the so-called Langville inequality. And what that says is that the number of FQ rational point of a n-dimensional uh, variety in the projective space of a given degree d uh, differs from the number of points of n-dimensional projective space by q to the power, by a sort of uh, order of q to the power n minus half. Uh, and then you have this d minus 1, d minus 2. So of course, if n is equal to 1, this is probably as good as you can 
do because then you have square root of q here, but in general you would, this is a pretty uh, bad bound, but that's uh, maybe the best you can do in that generality, plus some constant times q to the power n minus one. Where this constant is something which depends on the dimension of the variety, dimension of the ambient projective space, and the degree. In other words, it is independent of q. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the point here. And of course, if your variety is nice, then you can get much, much better estimate than n minus half. And this is one of the first corollaries uh, when uh, Dalin proved his uh, you know, Riemann hypothesis. So uh, there are two consequences in that paper. One is this, another is to do with the Ramanujan-Peterson conjecture. And that says that suppose you had a smooth complete intersection in a projective space uh, of dimension little n. So now I'm in capital N dimensional space. When I'm talking about complete intersection, that basically means it's defined by the right number of equations. Let's say R equations, where R is the co-dimension. Then the number of FQ rational points of X differs from the number of points of n dimensional projective space, which is here for your convenience, by a factor of q to the power n over two. So obviously if n is one, then q to the power n minus half and n over two are the same. But as soon as n grows, you know, this is much worse and this is far, far better. Where b prime n is essentially really an explicit quantity, it is the so-called primitive Betty number. As you know, for a complete intersection, it's essentially only the middle cohomology which would matter and you have to adjust it by one, uh, depending on whether uh, n is even or odd, and then you get this uh, b prime n, and uh, this is uh, something which, is, uh, which one knows explicitly, because uh, uh, you see, uh, when you have a complete intersection, uh, and you have the right number of equations, then uh, the, the degrees are, are uniquely determined. So you, you consider the so-called multi-degree, so here is one of the explicit formula for the primitive Betty numbers. So that suppose the multi-degree is d1 to dr, that means this is cut out by r homogeneous polynomials of degree d1 to dr, then, the, then this primitive Betty number is uh, sort of given by this formula. And I think one of the first place where you can find this is in the uh, work of Hirzebruch. Uh, although he, I don't think he worked over finite fields, but uh, <clears throat> But uh, there are other references. So, so that's, uh, that's sort of uh, uh, point I'm trying to make is this is, if you know your capital N, your, you know the multi-degree uh, and uh, you know the dimension, then this is something you can, you can effectively figure out. So this is, uh, and of course if N is equal to one, this will, uh, this will be an estimate which, is, which will be like uh, 2G, which is uh, you know, better than this generally. Okay. So that's the, those are uh, two classical results uh, from the 50s and the 70s uh, that are motivations for what we did in this paper, and maybe I will just state the theorem. Roughly speaking, there are three theorems in this paper, and I'll try to spend one slide each on each of them. So uh, the first theorem is, uh, is, a, is a generalization, if you like, of this uh, in the case of complete intersection, except that we don't require it to be smooth. So uh, you take a complete intersection of dimension n, uh, cut out by the right number of equations, uh, you have the multi-degree, and maybe you have some control on the dimension of the singular locus. So, so let's say S is the dimension of the singular locus, or in general S will be something bigger than or equal to the dimension of the singular locus. Then uh, this uh, inequality says that you have something like the primitive Betty number. By the way, this is the primitive Betty number of a smooth complete intersection. So this is still that same explicit quantity, uh, not with n, but n minus s minus one. And then the power of q you would get here can in principle be better than n minus half depending on uh, you know, how singular it is or how smooth it is. So it is actually q to the power n plus s plus two. Uh, n plus, sorry, n plus s plus one over two plus some constant, uh, which is also effective uh, into q to the power n plus s over two. If you, and this constant is actually zero if, uh, if your variety were smooth, which would mean that you could take s to be negative one. The singular locus is empty, so that dimension is minus one, and you can see that if you substitute minus one for s, you just get back the Lin's inequality. Of course, we're not saying that is a corollary because that is used in the proof, so that's uh, kind of cheating. 
But uh, another important thing is that the constant was sort of made uh, effective. This is not a very efficient bound, but it's still an explicit bound. Delta here is the maximum of the multi-degrees. And another, uh, uh, if you like, corollaries could be that uh, if suppose your complete intersection happens to be normal, which would mean it has no singularities in co-dimension one. So you could take, for instance, S is equal to N minus two. And if you, if you put that in, then you will get one here. So it's sort of the first Betty number. And if you just work it out, you will see that you actually get uh, Langeville also as a corollary. So you can think of this as a common generalization, at least for you know, normal complete intersections of uh, Langeville and Deline. So, so that was uh, uh, something that we proved. And one can use it to recover some of the older results and so on. I mean, Hooley and Cards had an ex uh, estimate like that without the, the constant, uh, explicit constant that are appearing here. So this is really, uh, uh, okay, so that's, that's theorem one. And what is uh, theorem two? Theorem two where we revisit Langeville. Uh, so that is this inequality. So what Langenwell says that this constant is uh, independent of Q, but they don't say how large or how, uh, you know, sort of how big it can be. So what we sort of do here is to is simply to kind of make it effective. And we say that suppose you had some, uh, you know, typically in practice when you are working on a variety, you're, you're given, it's defined by a bunch of uh, polynomials and you have some control over the degrees of those polynomials. I'm not necessarily saying that those number of equations is the right number. So well, there are some m equations of degrees d1 to dm. Then uh, what uh, we showed is that this constant here, could be, uh, could be bounded by some explicit quantity like that. And you also have a similar thing for a uh, affine um, uh, variety, not I mean, it doesn't have to be projective. And you can, uh, because you have something explicit here, you, you could also look at the other side and get a, a lower bound for uh, uh, you know, some type of uh, varieties. For example, one can kind of get an analogous result to a classical upper bound for the number of points of hypersurfaces over FQ. So that's uh, sort of uh, theorem two. And then theorem three, I'm just going to uh, describe it uh, in a superficial way, uh, partly because it is technical and partly since uh, I'm not so much thinking about it right now. Uh, so uh, what it is uh, to do is basically, you know, when Lang and Well wrote their famous paper, uh, they, they kind of, uh, you know, you have to remember this is before the trace formula and things like that. So you ha they have this inequality and they said that, okay, if you had a algebraic function field of dimension n over uh, finite field FQ, then there is a constant gamma for which this inequality holds uh, with uh, d minus one, d minus two replaced by gamma. You should think of gamma like two, two times the genus uh, if you were in the case of a curve. So what should be this gamma? And so they said that this gamma should be a, a birational invariant and it should be related to the, to the Picard variety. Uh, and, um, and they make uh, various uh, more precise, uh, what they call conjectural statements and, uh, about the zeta function and the characteristic polynomial of this Picard variety. And in effect, uh, what we showed in this paper is that this conjecture, because when you are uh, sort of over arbitrary uh, varieties, uh, it's not clear what is the right Picard variety to choose and so on. So if you take the correct Picard variety, then we showed that the conjecture is actually true. So these are roughly three theorems uh, that, uh, that were there in the paper. How much time do I have? Okay. So I just want to say something about the proof because this is something which went on for several years. And uh, as the quotation indicated, we, we used a lot of Bertini and we used some kind of uh, uh, suitable generalization of uh, weak Lepsius theorem, as you can already imagine when we are taking hyperplane sections, but we wanted that for singular varieties. So we did that and uh, of course we used the trace formula and uh, not just whale one, but whale two and uh, some estimates for Betty numbers and uh, uh, a little bit of complex analysis and combinatorics. And uh, so it was, uh, it was quite satisfying. Uh, and especially uh, what happened later on was something which took me completely by surprise because okay, we, uh, we spent some time trying to understand and we wrote it down and so on. And then people have over the years have found applications that we never imagined. 
For example, one of the result, places where the result got applied is in finite group theory. Uh, people trying to solve characterization of some kind of finite solvable groups by uh, identities which are analogous to this Engels identities for nilpotent groups. And uh, this very nice uh, piece of work by all these mathematicians, I think 2006 was in Compositio, or for uh, Warren's problem in function field, Francois Rodier and uh, more recently, student of Janova and so on, they've used it for Boolean functions or APN functions. People have used it in finite geometry for hyperovals in projective planes over finite field or uh, some kind of arithmetic progressions and so on and so forth. And, uh, and in fact, frankly, some of these applications, I don't even understand what, how you know, they, they find it useful. Especially, you know, thing about group theory is rather mysterious, uh, how uh, some estimates like that could, could uh, be useful in a discrete problem. Anyway, but uh, it's, uh, the result also has been extended. I mean, as I, I mentioned already, those estimates were not the sharpest possible, so people have tried to look at uh, somewhat uh, more uh, refined estimates. Is, and uh, I mentioned especially the, these people from Argentina, uh, Antonio Cafure and Guillermo Matera, who wrote a series of papers who, which kind of generalized or extended some of these inequalities. Okay, so, um, so this, this is one uh, thing. I, I wanted to talk about another thing. Uh, and uh, you see, in this same paper, we, we wrote a section, uh, the purpose of which was to actually uh, put down on paper something that Jill had already observed many years ago, but had not bothered to you know, write a paper about it. And uh, so, uh, so there is a conjecture there, which is, uh, which is really due to Jill. And what it is is the following, that suppose now uh, you, have a, you have a complete intersection, which is not necessarily irreducible even. And let's say it's, uh, it, you know the dimension, you know the degree, then the number of FQ rational points is bounded uh, above by, th by this quantity, okay? Remember, Pn is still the number of points of n-dimensional projective space. And I'll just, uh, uh, maybe this is clearer if I give you an example. Uh, simplest example is you think of, a, think of a hypersurface, or in other words, just take a homogeneous polynomial of degree d in m plus one variables and look at, uh, look at its uh, zeros in the projective m space over fq. So that means what? That means uh, this n will be equal to m minus one. So if you substitute n equal to m minus one, what you get is a very familiar inequality that the number of points of a hypersurface of degree d, oh, I'm sorry, this should be m, uh, should be bounded above by dq to the m minus one plus pm minus two. And this was, you know, once a conjecture made by Misha Fassman and rather quickly proved by jean pierre Serre in a letter to him uh, in July 89, if I remember correctly. And uh, so, so you can sort of think of this as a, as a generalization of this, uh, not just to hypersurfaces, but complete intersection where you have some control over the dimension and the degree, okay? And uh, um, some years later, Jill's prediction uh, came true. And uh, in fact, uh, those of you who have been attending AGCT would remember that Alan Kurer, uh, in fact, proved this conjecture in the affirmative and actually proved a much more general result where he, he actually looks at the, um, an arbitrary variety and uh, look at its, its, uh, the, uh, you know, the degrees and dimensions of its irreducible components and has a, has a inequality which in, already in the equidimensional case would, would sort of boil down to this. And in fact, uh, Jill and uh, Robert Rolla also wrote a nice paper uh, not too long ago, which is in the Journal of Pure and Applied Algebra. Now, <clears throat> you see this, uh, so this is you probably was, this conjecture was inspired by this inequality. And it seems there were two inspirations. So uh, Jill was inspired to make this conjecture. And Misha, on the other hand, who had originally proposed this inequality for a hypersurface, uh, together with his uh, student, also a student of uh, Root uh, Pelikan, who spoke this morning, uh, Boguslavsky, uh, they made uh, another, another generalization or another extension. So to, to explain that, let me just uh, introduce some notation. Uh, so I just want to spend one slide on this, if I may, and uh, then I, I'm more or less done. So you look at the maximum number of FQ rational point that are linearly independent homogeneous polynomial, all of same degree, D can have over FQ, 
Okay, so I, I denote it by E sub R D M. And the conjecture of Fassmann and Boguslavsky is that this is explicitly given by this formula. And where there are some new eyes, and what are these new eyes? What you do is you sort of look at m plus one tuples uh, indexing sets of monomials of degree d in m plus one variables, arrange them lexicographically, look at the R tuple in that, and that sort of determines this quantity. It's a fascinating conjecture. And I myself was quite fascinated with this uh, uh, thing. And uh, if you, uh, maybe I do, I'm running out of time, but suppose you were to take R is equal to one, you will see that it boils down to uh, sets inequality. And if R equal, in general, if R is less equal M, then you get uh, this uh, thing, you can just decode to that. Um, very good, uh, so what do we know about this conjecture? And uh, I, so this is maybe my last mathematical slide. Uh, uh, I, because and I say this because this is partly related to the paper of uh, Jill on the parameters of Reed Miller code, and this was something that Jill was somehow fond of saying. That he said, Well, look, uh, Misha and I made some conjectures around the same time. Mine turned out to be right, and Misha's not quite so. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Misha's conjecture also gave rise to a lot of mathematics. So, so R equal to 1, I already mentioned, R equal to 2 uh, was uh, settled by Boguslowski. And several years later, uh, my former student, Munmay Datta, and I, we showed uh, using a work of Zanella that uh, it is uh, actually true also if R is less than or equal to M plus one, provided you are looking at quadrics. But uh, more surprisingly, we showed that it can be false if the number of equations is more than the number of variables. And eventually, we showed that the positive results, true for the number of equations less equal number of variables, is, is true in general. And uh, then, uh, but then uh, since it is false sometimes, so we thought we should come up with a new guess and we proposed a new conjectural formula that I like to call the incomplete conjecture because it's not, you know, because you have R linearly independent polynomials, homogeneous of degree D, so the R can be maximum this, M plus D choose D. It doesn't go all the way but goes here. And this incomplete conjecture was established, for example, not just M plus one but M plus two choose two. And with uh, Peter Bellen, now we have proposed a, what we like to call a complete conjecture, which also takes care of all the values, but it's still an still a open thing. So I'm sort of uh, indicating some flowering, uh, uh, not necessarily the work of Jill. So I'll just stop with, uh, with uh, my formal concluding remarks. I, I thought I will forget a few things, but uh, so I just wrote it down. So uh, I hope I have made it clear that Jill has made important and uh, lasting contributions to mathematics, especially in the study of algebraic varieties over finite fields, linear codes, and so on. And his interests uh, and his knowledge, as at least my impression of me, is were quite deep and wide. And uh, when he became interested in some topics, he would, it was his tendency to, you know, sort of look deeper and not be in a rush to publish. And uh, as people have mentioned already, besides his contribution to mathematics, he was an institution builder. He, he, he helped nurture in great institutes like this CIRM where we are uh, sitting or standing and uh, continuing success of these AGCT conferences which by the way started as algebraic geometry and coding theory, some years later became arithmetic geometry and coding theory, and now arithmetic geometry, cryptography and coding theory, so you just think of C as an idempotent maybe. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's really uh, something which owes largely to his uh, vision and efforts. And besides these scientific uh, institutes and conferences, uh, some of you may know that Jill was the president of the French Pavilion at Oroville, uh, which is in Pondicherry in India. And you know, he had, he had read, or at least browsed through, I have seen this, significant amount of ancient and modern Sanskrit works, including Vedas, several of the Upanishads, and uh, the scholarly books of uh, Sri Aurobindo. Uh, some of you may know about this. And, and I, I should tell you that uh, if you sort of talk to an average Indian, in fact, 99% Indians would not have read these things, okay? so. Uh, uh, so that's something really, you know, remarkable. It's, it's not just because you're born in India, you, you, you know, you study all these things. And anyway, I sort of wanted to say that above all, he was a wonderful human being. It's always warm, generous, uh, you know, very kind. He was willing to help uh, others and, uh, you know, more or less go out of the way. So, you know, personally, it has been a pleasure, I think, an honor to have known him. 
and he'll certainly be missed. Thank you very much.